I think we can get started. Um, I'm really excited about today's panel. Um, and there's certainly been a lot of conversations in the chat and elsewhere about um, how uh, to work with uh, different commercial uh, providers of Jupiter. And it's a complicated, uh, interesting space where people are developing things in different directions. Um, we uh, are to start off, we're welcoming back Microsoft, who has uh, come to the conference last year and presented their project that was sort of like in alpha. And so we're excited to see how it's developed over the last year. And we've been working with them on uh, a branch of the Data 8 textbook materials um, that we're really excited about as well, because we think they are just a really, really easy on ramp for people to um, see the material quickly. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lee Stott. Morning, everyone. So I'm Lee Stott. I'm a principal program manager in Microsoft Cloud and AI. Um, I'm going to be spending the next 15 minutes talking to you about educational experiences and most importantly, what the work we've been doing with Berkeley and how we hope this will really help both colleges and larger institutions to adopt data science and data rate specifically. So if we just start off in terms of where Berkeley is, you know, Berkeley have been running computational inferential thinking now for a number of years. This is a picture from their last cohort. So around 1600 students is this probably the largest data science course in the world. And from this, they've really built a great set of fundamental materials, which again, this conference is about sharing best practice and how other institutions and colleges can adopt this content and really utilize it. And we've been working for the last year since last year's conference with Berkeley to try and enable other institutions around the world to really take data science and start teaching with data science. For number one, a blended learning experience, so being able to take bite-sized chunks of resources to then drop into your curriculum to really enhance that data science teaching with real hands-on labs and auto grade and assessment. So what are the key challenges today? You know, really COVID has created lots of new issues. We need to iterate with confidence and build secure and stable environments. And there was lots of sessions yesterday talking about that building of environments. And that seems to be one of the biggest pain points many institutions have today is how to build those scalable resources. Again, it's about mastering the new technologies and approaches to learning. And that's from both an educator and from a student. And then now with COVID, it's about how those students around the globe are not necessarily coming to your institution, will have that teaching experience. So again, this is really key, being able to provide access to resources at any time, anywhere, any place. So looking at operational challenges, infrastructure is a huge headache. We've all talked about it. There was a big session yesterday going from what we call uh, on-premise, so bare metal resources, to using cloud-based services. Again, you've got to think about that infrastructure. Again, you've got to think about that content. How are you providing that content to users? So you're providing notebooks, workbooks, quizzes, grading solutions, and submission processes. And again, what languages are you going to support? You're going to support Python, R, and again, platform support information, so collaborative working, communication tools, assessments, teaching assistants to actually start working with those students. So what we tried to do when we built the solution was look at all these different pedagogy aspects and think about how can we address those from a technology basis. So we developed a service called Microsoft Learn. So Microsoft Learn is a, a completely free online learning resource. You can go there and learn any part of the Microsoft technology stack in these bite-sized learning resources. All the content on Microsoft Learn is actually localized. So it's localized to 17 languages. So again, if you're teaching not in English, but in Spanish, French, German, Italian, you can go to that website and have a localized version of that content instantly. Again, all the content includes engaging quizzes and achievements of that gamification of learning. And again, there's a mixture of video, text, and interactive learning. So the discussions we had was around with work Berkeley was about how could we take that experience to the next level. So this is where Microsoft Learn really comes in play. So we wanted step-by-step -step learning guides. We wanted to create gamification and friction-free learning. 
this was really key to us. We wanted to be able to unlock students having that achievement and that experience. And again, build the content in bite-sized resource chunks that you could adapt and utilize, whether you were a K-12 school or you were a leading university who wanted to teach data science. So here's Foundations of Data Science. This is a Microsoft Learn module. As you can see, it's just under 13 hours of content made up of those bite-sized learning modules. Again, it's based around the textbook. So this is taking the formal text of interventional thinking. It's taking those interactive hands-on labs and then building mini labs, which are actually auto-graded using the auto-graded system. And again, it's then reinforcement learning with having quizzes within the content. So the students do the interactive lab, they do the mini lab, which is a hands-on coding aspect, and then they reinforce that learning through, uh, through an actual knowledge check. Again, we've provided a full infrastructure behind inferential thinking using a service called Visual Studio Code Spaces. And what I want to do now is talk about how as an institution you can deploy those solutions. So you've all heard of Visual Studio Code. You can experience Jupyter, Python, and R, either remotely or locally using the browser. All the resources that support influential thinking and foundations of data science on Microsoft Learn are within a GitHub repo, and they can be downloaded and then used on a local machine. One of the great things about Visual Studio Code is you have lots of extensions that are freely available. So you can install Python, R, things like LiveShare to collaborate and communicate across teams or do live sharing between students. And again, you've got things like the VS Code OKPy OK Grader solution as an extension. So again, it gives you all those different toolings and support to be able to do both teaching in class and out of class. In terms of remote development, this is where things become really interesting. So we've actually provided a dev container remote development environment for data rate influential thinking. So this is a, uh, an actual Docker container, which has all the resources, all the content, Jupyter, Python, Autograder, which you can deploy either locally on any student's machine or within a cloud-based service. So this is how you would actually download and utilize the foundations of data science on your local machine. You'd literally go to the foundations of data science, you'd open up the GitHub repo, which we have available. You would then download the actual repo file. Did we lose Lee? Hello? I'm back again. Yeah, you're back on now. Oh, God. I don't know what happened there. Um, so you can deploy that environment to, uh, to your local machine. So the next environment I want to show you is Code Spaces. So this is the Code Spaces environment, which now comes along with Visual Studio Code. So this is available through the repo, so you can deploy this directly through the repo. So again, you go to the Microsoft Learn website, you go to the actual environment, and you can deploy the environment to any resource. So again, you choose, you want to deploy this to Visual Studio Code Spaces, you'd sign in with your Azure account, you then deploy that resource to the code space environment. Um, again, you can set things like timeout, so this reduces the cost. So in our case, we say people to allocate the virtual machines for 30 minutes. And again, the code spaces environment is deployed for the end user. So we've shown you the options of either using a, a, a physical code on a desktop if the students don't have internet access, or directly within a code space environment. So again, this is Visual Studio Studio Code natively in a browser.
Lee, we lost you again. Back again. You're back now. <sighs> nope, we lost you. environment for data a and the, and the foundations of data science will cost around eight dollars for a student to utilize so that's well within the current azure so i'll hand over to Nair. Hi everyone, uh, I hope um, I will not have technical difficulties as Lee had. Um, anyway, I'm near. Uh, I'm an engineering manager uh, as well as uh, teaching in uh, Tel Aviv University in the computer science department. And um, basically what I would like to show you in the next 15 minutes is how everything uh, comes together. So uh, we uh, did two things. One is to have a dedicated um, landing page, uh, as you can see here, where all the academic content uh, resides. Currently, we have there uh, three courses. One is the fundamental of data science from Berkeley. We also have uh, cloud technologies from CMU uh, and IoT from, um, from Oxford. Uh, this page, the, the target audience for, for it are students uh, as well as uh, educators, meaning uh, professors and TAs. So this is the first thing uh, we did. Wait a second. I'm trying to move to the next slide. Lee, can you please move to the next slide? The second thing uh, that uh, we did was to build uh, an LTI tool. LTI tool is basically a learning management uh, uh, system app where uh, uh, our goal is to provide an experience which is frictionless, intuitive, um, very simple to, to consume, uh, both for the professors as well as the students. This LTI tool is leveraging um, an API, an open API that we have to Microsoft Learn, which basically enables us to go through the full catalog uh, of learning modules. Uh, and we package that into a single app, which um, is uh, installed on the institutional uh, uh, Azure tenant. Uh, it is compatible with 98% of the learning management systems, meaning that uh, it will work with Moodle and Canvas and Blackboard. Um, and we are open sourcing it because we think that uh, it can serve as a reference implementation for institutions who would like to uh, implement a similar application, not necessarily um, on an LMS or they have an LMS which is not uh, LTI uh, compliant. So uh, uh, with these two, uh, um, two, the tool as well as the, the page, um, we are able to generate an experience. Lee, can you please move to the next slide? generate an experience which um, encapsulates, uh, uh, for example, the data aid course, the foundation of data science, both with the content as well as the needed infrastructure on Azure. So um, I, I'm going to show you, uh, hopefully, two videos. One is the uh, educator experience where the educator is going to configure the tool um, as well as add uh, some links and um, Microsoft Learn modules uh, such that the students will get an assignment that they can trigger as a link from the learning management system and they will have everything there. The assignment includes both the content on Learn as well as a uh, link to code spaces where all the uh, notebooks uh, are. So uh, Lee, can you please move to the next slide? So this is the educator experience, and if uh, you lose, let me know if uh, you can't hear me throughout uh, the video. Lee, can you please move to the next one and uh, show the video? 
So this is Moodle, uh, and this is the way you actually configure uh, an LTI tool, uh, which uh, you need to, to name it and then select uh, the tool. Um, once you save that um, on Moodle, uh, you go back to the course page and you have a link. This link spins up the tool. The tool is basically um, an aid that uh, uh, enables the, the professor to configure uh, some text and links uh, with instructions for the students, as well as the tutorials. As you can see on the uh, right hand side, I'm logged in. We're using single sign on, which means that once the professor and students, you'll see this in the next video, um, are logging into the learning management system, they're automatically logged in to, uh, to Azure and to code spaces. So here we select the due date and we are adding some links. These links can be uh, linked to code spaces or linked to teams for, for a teams channel that uh, uh, the students are going to use uh, doing this assignment uh, and any other uh, uh, link that you can think about. This is the way you configure tutorials. So we are looking, we have a search, a search bar where you can actually look for the specific module that uh, you would like to the student to go through and you add it. Um, and uh, uh, you can preview uh, what the students are going to see, as well as see the list of students that is coming from the elements. Once you're good with everything, you publish. And when you are published, basically the link is becoming active for the students. So the students will, well, once the students will press this link, uh, um, the tool will open and it will open in a student view and not in, in, in a, uh, a professor view because we are context aware. We know from the LMS what is the role of each each person. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the educator experience. Lee, can you please move to the next? So the next one is the student experience. Um, OK, so now uh, I'm logged in as a student and then I press the link. As you can see, now it's not an editing uh, screen, but uh, just a consuming screen and the student uh, is automatically logged into code spaces as well. And now the student is actually configuring um, the needed uh, 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 parts that uh, uh, are, are for the uh, assignment. Um, and uh, the environment is being deployed. Um, once it will be deployed, uh, the student will be able to open uh, um, a notebook uh, or a lab and basically go through the, the, uh, the module with the, the text and the content, as well as uh, try everything on the notebook here on Code Spaces. In a second, you'll see that. So this is the full fundamental of data science content, and we're going to a specific uh, module. We're opening the notebook. and the mini lab, the related mini lab. And then going back to the um, to the LTI tool for the for, to for to uh, spin up the learn specific learn module. And start going through the content. Uh, um, on learn as well as on code spaces. So this is it. Any questions? Quickly, mm -hmm. somebody asked about accessibility. So, uh, um, we are uh, the tool is open sourced um, and learn is accessible. Um, the tool uh, is built. Uh, we don't have form. We didn't formally uh, took it through the accessibility. Uh, uh, um, uh, all the accessibility requirements, but uh, we use standard practice, so it should be accessible. Yeah, so again, I don't know if you heard. Sorry about the internet. We had a thunderstorm power out. Um, so yeah, so learn is is uh, accessible and it's localized as well. So all the influential thinking data rate module is actually in 17 different languages. 
Great. Um, okay, to move on, maybe we can yep. have some more questions later. Um, David Lynn, are you ready? I'm ready. <coughs> Hello, this is David Lynn. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Give me a second. I assume you can see this. Let me move the chat window real quick. Yeah, looks good. Great. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm David Lynn with Volcarium. Uh, super happy to be here on this panel. Uh, this is my first time participating in the workshop, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. Really impressed with all the quality of the sessions. So kudos to Berkeley, Eric, and uh, the rest of the DSD team. Um, in terms of an agenda for, for my portion, I will cover a little bit about uh, my, my company, Volcarium and then discuss uh, how Cornell uh, University has uh, deployed uh, their data science for all course using uh, Data8 and Volcarium, and then finally present a slide um, about some case studies with uh, data science and machine learning. So first of all, a little bit about Volcarium. Uh, we're in the business of providing cloud-based virtual learning labs, and our labs are completely self-contained workspaces that come with uh, compute, storage, and tools, all hosted and managed by Volcarium in the cloud, there's no need for you to install anything, um, you know, as an instructor or at university IT. Everything is um, built up in the context of learning and research. So we are completely targeted and focused on, on education. Uh, the workspaces are um, initialized by the instructor with content and comes with the workflow and tools for assessing the student work. And so it also provides controls for budget, security, scalability. Uh, it is accessible. Um, and uh, our first labs were deployed in 2014 for mostly for computer science classes, and then the scope has uh, widened greatly. Currently, we're used in used by over half a million active learners, and uh, in over 700 institutions worldwide. The top three areas of focus for us are, of course, data science, uh, cloud computing, and programming. Uh, but we're seeing more and more use now with uh, machine learning cybersecurity and full stack programming. Um, <clears throat> we do support a very broad range of assessment options. So you can kind of mix and match the strategies that uh, would engage your students and also give you the ability to deliver timely feedback and assessment. Um, so on top of a really efficient manual grading flow, uh, we do support auto grading. Uh, in the Jupyter case, uh, we're supporting MB grader. Uh, we also uh, have a mastery learning um, capability for self-paced courses. And then we can also gamify the whole experience with uh, competitions and leaderboards, uh, and then collaboration through team projects and peer reviews. In terms of our infrastructure, uh, we manage everything in our cloud. And as I mentioned, uh, everything is accessible uh, through the browser. There's no need for any installation. I think what um, makes us different from a lot of the other commercial lab solutions is the breadth of our solution. We consider it our job to leverage the latest and greatest in the cloud and IT infrastructure, so you don't have to. And then we can also deliver the labs at the, um, at the lowest price point possible. And so it might be by delivering web applications um, like Jupyter in our Elastic uh, server farms or uh, delivering you know, a simple Unix account on a shared server. Uh, or even launching clusters for big data jobs. Um, we have also launched uh, cyber ranges that um, include a network of Unix and uh, Windows virtual machines. So in terms of um, the front end for the learner, we don't believe that there's one ID that can support all learners in all use cases. So we do have our own uh, ID, but we also offer uh, Eclipse Thea, uh, which is very similar to VS Code. Um, we support uh, Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter Lab, R Studio, uh, and even can stream full desktop experiences, Windows and uh, Linux experiences. So specific to data science and Jupyter, uh, we do host our own Jupyter Hub, and it's tied into the Volcarium workflow. And this includes the auto grading based on MB grader. Here, the, in the instructor could instrument uh, their copy of a notebook, 
with, uh, with solutions uh, and or assessments. And then during the release process, the clean version of notebooks is generated and deployed to the student. And then after the student completes the work and submits the assignment, our system will automatically grade it uh, and also set the scores. And as you can see, there's a submit button up the, at the top. Uh, there's scores on the right and some teacher comments embedded inside the, the notebook. Uh, we do have also a very robust set of features to support exams, both residential and online. For example, during the COVID period, we had a data science final exam with 100 students that needed to be run asynchronously. Uh, what that meant was, you know, students were given um, the ability to run a 60 minute exam at their own time at their own place during the final week of the semester. And so that was very successful. Um, our platform is uh, also very suitable for advanced coursework and research. So that would include running really long jobs, processing hundreds of gigabytes of data. So it's not just for intro to data science or intro to CS. This, um, you know, it can be used for upper level uh, coursework as well. And so, for example, Columbia University had an assignment in their machine learning um, micromasters on edX that would run for 48 hours. Um, we are also the platform behind an ongoing COVID research hackathon that's uh, hosted by Stanford and Cornell. Um, and uh, now we do realize that most real work uh, requires you to know a combination of tools. So on the right hand side here, we're showing a lab which includes Jupyter Lab at the front end, but also ties in uh, AWS natural, lang natural language processing service uh, called Comprehend and the Twitter API. And so um, just to add to the last point, we've been working with AWS for the last four years to make AWS accounts available to educators and learners through a few programs. Uh, in particular, AWS Educate provides a really convenient way for instructors to request AWS accounts and credits for their students in a policy controlled and budgeted way. And for uh, Nir and Lee, um, the and uh, and uh, the Google folks in the audience, we'd love to work with you guys, you guys too. Um, during some of the earlier sessions, uh, we heard a lot about the desire to link assignments and pass grades and feedback between Jupyter and your learning management systems. And just wanna let you know that, uh, that we do support uh, pretty much all of the popular LMSs uh, through LTI integration. So that would include Canvas and Moodle, desire to learn. Uh, we also support uh, some of the MOOC platforms uh, including edX and Coursera. Um, here, uh, what we're showing is essentially a Jupyter Lab integrated into Canvas through the use of Vocarium. And here is uh, Jupyter Hub um, launched in edX or open edX, and again through, through Vocarium. So we do realize that labs aren't um, always used in isolation. So we do have a robust set of uh, APIs to integrate them in different contexts. For example, if you uh, want, you can use these APIs to manage your content in a Git repo, update the lab content, or use SSO functions to integrate them into a custom application. So at this point, I'd like to switch gears and present a few slides about 1380 a course at Cornell University taught by Professor David Williamson. Um, this is a course that was cross-listed among three different departments, the Operations Research Group uh, Department, the Computer Science and Statistics Department. The goal of the course was, you know, as, as you may know, is to introduce data science to students with uh, no programming or stats background at all. And for many of the students, uh, this was the first and only STEM course that they had planned to take at Cornell University. Uh, most of their students um, came from or come from the College of Arts and Science, uh, where it fulfills a math and qualitative reasoning requirement. Um, they also have a lot of students from the business school and the hotel management program, but very few actually from the uh, College of Engineering. The course itself um, is largely an import of uh, Data 8 from Berkeley and leveraged all of the free material. And that included the online textbooks, the lecture slides, the demos, and the, the assignments. They started teaching the course in 2018, and all the lectures and demo assignments are hosted on Vocarium. 
uh, students uh, try out the course or have the, um, the option to try out the course in the platform for a few weeks and then pay a nominal fee if they decide to stick with it. The original port of the, uh, the data assignments and, and labs were done by um, professors uh, Madeline Udell in the operations research group and then um, uh, Michael Clarkson in, uh, in computer science. Some extensions uh, that they made were to provide hints in a notebook, for example, checking for common errors, maybe checking to see if the student's answer is of the correct type. They also incorporated auto grading into the notebook, which really allowed them to scale. Some of the reasons why they chose uh, Volcarium, uh, in, in their words, uh, essentially you can take a look at the, the, the target audience for the, uh, the course. The goal was really to lower the barrier of entry as much as possible. So there's an assumption that there is, uh, you know, no, no assumption on uh, any technical background, uh, being and only assuming that uh, the students can navigate a web browser, nothing else. Since there were no installation issues, um, or no installation, there's no installation issues, there's no need to allocate staff to, to manage any issues. Um, it was also very important to make sure that grading was very easy, right, uh, since they wanted to move it at scale. And, uh, and so both auto, automated grading as well as manual grading for instructors to grade freeform answers. Other features that um, made a difference for, for Cornell was the, uh, the integration with Canvas. Uh, since uh, the auto grading happens and then grades are pushed automatically straight into the LMS into the speed grader. Uh, and then students also had direct access through the LMS. There's no need for a separate login into Volcarium um, other than from, from the LMS, right? So they can log into the LMS and get right into, into the labs. And as I showed you earlier, it can actually be embedded inside the LMS as well. Uh, they also mentioned being able to perform or allowing the students to perform unlimited to sim submissions and to check progress was really good for keeping the students motivated, right? Um, and what really made it easy for the instructors was um, the fact that Volcarum can help manage slip day budgets. And that really removes having to deal with excuses for late submissions. Um, and so uh, overall, together with uh, all the Data 8 materials, the Volcarum features, uh, I think they concluded that uh, the course was really, really straightforward to teach and they've been doing it for the last three years. Of course, uh, then COVID hit in, in March and all the students left campus and had to resume the course from home. Luckily for 1380, they didn't have to change anything or not very much. The workflow was already in place, very familiar for the students, made it, the course a, a really nice success in that, in that manner, right? Um, so if you have any questions about that, the Cornell experience, um, I know that uh, Professor Williamson is available and uh, he's registered and available on the Slack channel. Um, so if you want to reach out to him, I'll also paste his email into the chat uh, later on. And uh, finally, I just wanted to share uh, a few other, uh, a few other Jupiter related case studies uh, it's published on our website uh, from the University of Toronto, Columbia University, Kellogg School of Management and um, an advanced class on machine learning from, from Cornell. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to hearing from you and happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Thank you, David, that was awesome. Uh, moving on to Philip. Um, from cool, yeah, thanks. Um, sorry, got lagged a, a bit in there. So, um, Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, I'm Philip, uh, and for the past one and a half years, I've been working on DeepNode, which is a collaborative data science notebook. Um, I'm gonna turn on the sharing right now of the whole screen. Hopefully this works. And hopefully you all can hear me and see the screen. Um, yeah, hopefully that works. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, DeepNode is a collaborative data science notebook. Uh, probably I would like to highlight the word collaborative because we try to remove all the barriers which exist when you're setting up a notebook or getting it out into the world, whether you want to simply share it with your 
colleague or you want to share it with a course full of 500 students. Um, maybe also a bit about DeepNode. As I mentioned, we started one and a half years ago. During that time, uh, we went through a startup accelerator called Y Combinator, and we have already supported University of Cambridge and uh, London Business School. Um, I personally take care of everything desi design related in DeepNode. Um, and previously, I worked as a software engineer, also studied um, computer science. So, um, I'm oh, sorry, I will also turn off the camera because it's slowing me a bit down. Hope you don't mind. Um, now, what I want to talk about today, um, I, I want to do a quick uh, introduction of the platform and also go with you through a quick demo of a, of a course assignment. The, the course assignment is, is an example workflow from uh, University of Cambridge's machine learning course. Uh, this was managed by DeepNote. Um, like we won't i won't show you the actual questions and so on um that's not public uh, but we will go through the, the workflow the, the professor and the students um used while um they were using deep note um before i jump into that there's one important um thing to note unlike the tools before a deep note is not a dedicated education tool uh, we support a wide spectrum of users, data scientists, analysts, and also students or educators. Um, if you are a professor or a student, you probably get two main things out of DeepNode, and that's easy setup and real-time collaboration with your students. So without further um, delaying anything, I can now jump into a live demo of the, the platform, actually. Um, I recommend you to maybe um, put this on full screen or so because um, it, the, the text might uh, be a bit small otherwise. Um, so this will have two, two parts. Um, in the first part, um, I will go through the, the, like the platform in general, and then I will talk about the, the student um, assignment scenario. Um, so what we see right now is the, the profile interface. Um, there's loads of stuff going on. Don't worry about it. This is uh, simply my account, which I also use to test many other things. What we are really interested in is the, <clears throat> so these are projects on the right side. On the left side, we got teams. Um, what we are interested in is the DS177 team. This is something what I've created for uh, the, this presentation. Uh, it doesn't have any projects. It has two members, uh, myself and a student. Um, but we'll get to this in a, in a bit. So now let's start by actually um, creating a new project and going through the workflow. Um, so um, if you're familiar with something like Jupyter Lab or um, any kind of IDE, um, you will perhaps find this um, um, intuitive or easy to familiarize yourself with. Um, we got the files on the left side. We got something like an environment tab, which tells us that we're the pro machine. We got 66 packages installed. Um, and we also got something called the comments. We'll get to this um, in a bit. Um, now here's our onboarding. Um, and um, I we can either pick one of these templates, but we're actually going to upload an IPINB file. So we are fully um, um, compatible with with the IPINB format. And if I do um, assignment and I upload this, I can drop it right in here. Um, or I can actually delete the old one. So um, um, yeah, now we got into uh, uh, like let's say a dummy assignment, which. Uh, which we actually prepared when we uh, were testing out the Teams feature. We had this a scenario where um, where one of us was the teacher, the other were students, and this is basically how we built out the Teams feature. So it kind of works. This uh, sorry fits this workflow. Um, um, and now let's go through a couple of um, features which I personally find really really helpful and and interesting. Um, so let's say I run the first cell. Um, oh, by the way, so this is this is all um, cloud based. It's running in my browser um, just to just to like um, clear of any confusion. Um, um, so the first one um, is that we got this cell um, with a you know, with a pi variable. 
when I run this, you can see that the, the, the Pi displays in the le bottom left sidebar. Um, this isn't that interesting if you have a single variable, so we can also define this data frame. Um, but if you have uh, if you have tens of these, it's really easy to get get lost, get, uh, to to lose yourself. So um, and and it's like the hidden state of a notebook is a big deal. So um, this does help you a lot with the orientation. Um, here um, I've read, I've downloaded a sample CSV from the internet and we provide some extra analysis on top of that. So you can maybe see the, uh, the distribution of some numbers or some, some string classification um, out of it. Of course, you can always switch to typical to a uh, good old Jupyter row output. Uh, now that's data frames. Um, now we can take a look at comments, something that's re very relevant to an educational setting. Um, um, you can simply, maybe I'm confused about uh, why are these imports not um, first, why is there the pi? So I can be like, knit the imports should be first. And um, everyone who has access to this notebook will be able to see and um, we'll be basically able to see the see the comment. Um, and maybe lastly, uh, there are terminals um, which uh, which are really useful for a subset of users because they are maybe a bit more technical or their or your course needs some custom setup. So you have full pseudo access to a terminal right in here. So maybe if something's not easily installable through pip, you can always. Um, you can always usually debug everything through here. Also, if you are uh, if you encourage um, version control in in your uh, projects or in your assignments, um, this is the place. Well, this is not a Git repository, but this is the place where the student would be able to use Git and version the notebook. Um, so. Um, <clears throat> Of course, we are trying to solve more uh, challenges which notebooks bring, but these are the ones I think are the most relevant for an educational setting. If I move this uh, thingy in the bottom right, there's also a documentation at docs at that, that tells you a little bit more. Don't worry, I will post all of these links later on into the chat. Um, so I will close this now because um, it's not that um, relevant right now. So I'm letting me move this maybe here. Um, cool, so now let's jump into the promise scenario uh, of a professor and a student and an example workflow in inside of the deep note. Let's uh, clear these comments and all the all the outputs. We don't need to see that right now. Let's also restart the notebook itself, the whole state. Um, cool, that's now, that's now working. So now um, I'm the professor and I would like to share this notebook with uh, the rest of the class. Um, I will be doing this example in two tabs. The second tab is right in here. So hopefully you won't get confused that much. Uh, I will try to talk you and guide you through this. Um, so yeah, we will we'll get through it together. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, now I'm the professor. I, I maybe worked on some kind of an assignment by myself. And um, now I want to share it with the, with the students. So. What I'm going to do probably is give it a, some kind of a le descriptive name, lecture one. And now what I would do, remember that we had the DS177 team, which we initially created. Um, and now I will change the owner to be the data science course. Um, what I would do probably at this point as a professor, I would send out everyone an email that, hey, lecture number one is, is available and you can maybe um, check it out. Uh, now I'm now I'm trying to um, um, mimic the role of the student. So um, this is the student account. They just got the email. They would come into the platform and they would see that oh, there's there's lecture one available inside of the team. So let's let's actually check it out. Um, as a student, um, I uh, so as you can see, there's both me and and the, and the professor. As a student, I have only comment access. Of course, this is changeable. You can change this, um, but like you probably as a professor don't want the students to maybe change anything in the notebook you just created. So um, all I can do at this point 
is, is clone the, the whole uh, project so I can work on it by myself. I can also add um, admins of the, the team, which means the professor as collaborators, but I want to, I don't want to do that. I want to work on it by myself and once the deadline is near, then I will submit it. So let's actually duplicate this. <clears throat> um, so now I have my own project with a, again, a dedicated machine. This is all very seamless and um, and here, um, I at this point, probably as a student, I would just head down, start start working on the questions themselves. I think um, so. As I mentioned, this is something that we did as an exercise. I think we are yeah calculating the volume of a three dimensional ball. So I um, here is a small um, small typo. Uh, there's a there's a uh, in this assertion there is a negative volume, which is uh, I'm not sure possible. Um, so me as a student would probably get confused about this, but uh, maybe I would want to let the uh, professor know that, uh, hey, there's this will probably like this will be also happening for other students. So what I can simply do is that I can share this notebook. Um, now I have a public link which anyone can visit and it's a view um, access. So I will just simply change this to edit so um so the professor can can correct this if it's if it's wrong so i will now move these tabs like this um hopefully that's um still visible um on, on smaller screens um and now as a professor that's on the left side i will paste the the link here i just copied as you can see i have edit access and um um, I see that the student has um, highlighted this uh, this line, so I can simply come delete this and add a comment that um, hey, there was a typo on line one fixed now. Thank you. So and. Yeah, and that's fake. That's updated as a professor. I would now know that there was a typo. I could update the original notebook um, and just let everyone know that it's been updated. So at this point, presumably I would I would leave as the professor. I don't need to be here uh, anymore. And coming back to this to, to the student, I would probably I will turn off the sharing because I don't know what I don't want anyone else to to come into my notebook. Um, and at this point, I would probably um, complete the rest of the assignment. And at the end, I would either uh, submit this as a as a Jupyter notebook, a PDF, or here you can see we created a custom function for an assignment submission. So the student would simply run the last cell, and this would submit all the um, this would submit some answers to uh, to a server we we set up. Um, so that's about it when it comes to the demo itself. I will jump back to Figma where I got my slides. Um, so we recently uh, supported these courses. It's been the machine learning class on the University of Cambridge, London Business School, Charles University, and many other individual online courses, uh, usually not associated with universities. Um, maybe what's worth mentioning is that DeepNode is free for academia. Uh, we are really happy to provide the free machines for whole courses. Um, if you would go to deepno.com, you would see that there's a, there is a wait list. This doesn't apply to academia. You just if you reach out to us, we will just send you an invite link right away. Um, and um, as we've seen with the previous um, previous courses, um, there were some custom requests or maybe a need for stronger or more powerful machines. Um, we are also happy to partner on that and then work out any something what works for, for everyone. Um, so yeah, if this sounds interesting, um, reach out to me, philip at deepnode.com or visit deepnode.com slash education. I will again paste this into the um, into the chat. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we are doing the questions at the end, so um, I will probably read them and maybe reply to them in the uh, in Teams itself, um, or I will, um, or maybe we can talk about them 
light your own. Awesome, Philip. Thank you. Um, really, really exciting to see all the stuff that you guys are building. Uh, Tim Novikov from CoLab. Uh, yep, one second. Let me just uh, set it up. And that was wanna, awesome, Philip. By the way, really enjoyed that. Do you want to put your video on, Tim, too, so we can see you talking? <laughs> sure. One second. It says uh, you can share your video when you're done screen sharing. Oh, all right. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Looks good. Cool. I we'll just want to do one last little bit of setup. Uh, cool. So, uh, yeah, my name is Tim. I'm the uh, product. Uh, by the way, Philip, that was awesome. Really enjoyed the presentation. And I'm inspired by presenting directly from Figma. Maybe I'll do that next time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I hadn't seen that before. This looks awesome. So, uh, my name is Tim. I'm the product manager for Colab. You know, if you don't know, Colab allows you to write and execute ar arbitrary Python via the browser. It's basically hosted Jupyter Notebooks by Google. Uh, it's integrated with your Google account, which means if you're signed into Chrome or you're signed into Gmail, then you're already signed into Colab. And it's integrated with Google Drive. So when you create a new notebook in Colab, it's automatically uh, synced to Drive. A brief history of Colab. A lot of people don't know this, but Colab actually began a very long time ago. I think this is even in the uh, IPython days as an internal tool uh, for data analysts at Google. And uh, it's now the sort of ubiquitous tool within Google for, the, for, for data scientists. Uh, in 2014, it started uh, being used for our internal crash courses, like the internal machine learning crash course. Uh, that's where most Googlers learned, uh, learned machine learning or TensorFlow. Uh, and in 2017, sort of as part of the push to open source TensorFlow, uh, CoLab, uh, and we, we sort of also open sourced the machine learning crash course. And for that purpose, uh, they sort of looked at what, what were all the platforms that, uh, that they could use for that. And CoLab was the best one for that. And so uh, that's the reason CoLab was actually launched was to facilitate uh, the Google machine learning crash course. Um, the same things that made it good for the machine learning crash course inside of Google also made it really great for machine learning and data science courses outside of Google. And so since then, we've sort of exploded in, in adoption, uh, largely through adoption in the, the college setting, where you know uh, it's extremely common for machine learning boot camp courses, MOOCs, uh, or, or courses, or, or uh, you know, small operations to basically use CoLab. So without further ado, I think I will also do a little demo here. Um, can you all see my blank tab here? Yeah, uh, looks good. Looks good. All right, cool. Looks good. Cool. So I've just gone to collab.research.google.com. If you're curious about the URL, actually, it's because we are part of Google Research, which is um, so sometimes also referred to as Google AI. It's the 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 sort of academic academia type part of Google, uh, where all the research and machine learning does. And sure enough, we, we sit right next to uh, the TensorFlow team and the, the quantum computing team, et cetera. So we're not part of uh, like, um, you know, G Suite or cloud or anything. All right, so I've created a, uh, a, new, uh, a new notebook. So this is a Jupyter notebook um, in Colab. Let's see, I'll do, I like to, do this to start. I'll, I'll hit Shift Enter, and it'll uh, it'll connect me to a VM. You can sort of see the state as it's connecting right here. Uh, in some sense, this is like the the magic of Colab, right? Like it just works. Like you just go to a new tab, you know, start start a new notebook, and you're you can you just start doing your Python. You right? just write even import TensorFlow. It it works. Uh, you can import the the you know. Uh, uh, the tools for for machine learning, uh, you know, uh, uh, and everything is right there. Uh, basically, the way this works, is, as I think a lot of people here will already understand, you know, the as a user, I'm now connected to a virtual machine that's hosted on Google Cloud, uh, and this VM has uh, tons of libraries pre-installed. In fact, you can see all of them by doing pip list, and th this will show everything that's uh, that's pre-installed. Oops. Let's see. So this is this is an output cell. 
And you can see there's tons of stuff. There's tons of visualization libraries. So Plotly, Altair, um, 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 Matplotlib, Seaborn, they're all sort of pre-installed. Um, over on the left, you might be seeing a UI that's a little different. This is an experimental UI I have, I have, so it might look a little different for you um, if you're sort of in the outside world. But uh, so, some, somehow or another, you'll be able to click this file browser, and you can actually see that this VM also has some, uh, some sample data in it. In fact, you can, uh, back in the notebook, type ls and see uh, what directories you have available, and then you'll be able to CD into sample data. Go. And let's see. Do cat. Uh, so I'm just going to read in a, a, a um, one of these things. Because I'm just uh, just sort of printing out in the simplest possible way. Uh, pandas uh, is our, also pre installed, so you can import pandas, turn it into, uh, import it into a data frame. So it's really easy to get started. And I think, you know, the critical thing, speaking to the same point Philip made, is that it sort of reduces the barriers. You know, you as a professor can just tell your students to do all this stuff and it, and it just works. There's no environment set up. Um, let's see how I'm doing on time here. Um, yeah, let me switch over to a different tab. Right here is our welcome notebook. So this is actually, if instead of clicking new notebook, you clicked on the welcome notebook. We have here our welcome notebook, which you can think of this as sort of a marketing site. It's as if Google Docs had a marketing site that was written as a Google Doc. <laughs> like this is a Colab notebook. Uh, that's a Jupyter notebook that explains what Colab is. Uh, if you scroll down, you'll see a little bit, uh, just a little bit, uh, a hint of what you can do with data science. Here, it's, uh, I think, just using uh, NumPy and Matplotlib to generate some random data and, and plot it. Um, and so you sort of get a vague flavor for that. Uh, down at the bottom, there's some really great resources. There's a notebook here that's all about how to load data from Google Sheets, uh, you know, which is Google's version of Excel, if you're not familiar with it, and Drive, and from Google Cloud Storage. Uh, you can use BigQuery. It's also this notebook, which is about visualizing data just uh, uh, have that preloaded in another tab. So it just shows like, examples of, uh, of you know, Plotly and Altair and, and, and other vis visualization libraries uh, working right inside of Colab. Um, so now I think I'll pop back into the, into the, the Colab notebook, which I, I'm just gonna rename. <laughs> Merkley, uh, it kills me the untitled. So uh, let's see. Here are some things that you can do in Colab. So right now we're connected to a VM that has a uh, just a CPU. But if you click Change Runtime Type, you can actually select the GPU runtime, uh, and then you're, it'll it'll actually reconnect me to a, a GPU runtime. You can see it's disconnecting from the old runtime, reconnecting to a new one. You can also choose a TPU, which is a tensor processing unit. So if you're if you're doing some fancy machine learning or actually using TPUs, you can do that. Although we discourage people from uh, just using TPUs or GPUs for no reason, like these ex hardware accelerators are not, you know, pixie dust that just make your code run faster. You actually know, uh, need to know uh, how to write the code to take advantage of them. Uh, so we sort of just discourage people from using GPUs unless they're unless they're actually going to use the GPUs. Uh, some random other fun stuff in Colab. Uh, there's a bunch of keyboard shortcuts. So for you know, you can really become a power user uh, in Colab and be very uh, productive. There's um, Executed code history is pretty cool. I guess there's nothing in there right now because we just um, we just connected to a new runtime. But here I'll execute some cells out of order. Um, but you'll see that they uh, you know they show what's going on in uh, in the order in which they executed. Uh, reverse crown. I guess. Uh, you can also uh, diff notebooks. So this is another one that uh, I think here, that it'll, it'll actually just be diffing to identical notebooks because there's only one version of this notebook because I just created it. But if you have a notebook that you're working on for a long time, you can actually uh, you know, revert back to, to old versions and see, see what, it, what it is that you, you know, deleted and wanted back. And uh, I have definitely taken advantage of that feature many times. Um, and you know, it's, you know, one way to think about Colab is sort of like Google Docs for, for programming and, and it's integrated with Drive in the sense that, you know, you can share a notebook, you get the familiar, uh, you know, Drive interface and the same ACLs where you can share it with, with certain settings. 
um, you know, here I'll share it with my personal account, Tina Bogov at Gmail, not to be confused with Tina Bogov at Google. You have to go outside the Google organization. So there's sort of like, you know, corporate uh, safeties there, since again, Google is the, uh, the internal uh, Jupyter solution at Google. Uh, and then, of course, I can also uh, comment on stuff. So here I can pick a cell and say, uh, there is probably a simpler way to do this and comment. Um, and, you know, just like Google Docs, that comment is there. You know, the other version of me can, you know, can, can respond and whatnot, or I can uh, add more. So it, it, it works in, in a familiar way. Um, so then to wrap things up, I will jump back over into my deck. Uh, this deck was sort of adopted from a deck I had uh, presented Colab at for uh, TensorFlow Dev7. Uh, and it was some tips and tricks for using Colab that were somewhat machine learning specific. Most of them were generic, um, but, uh, but, but they all have some sort of lesson for this crowd as well. So um, I'm, I, I did cut, cut out the first few. <laughs> so it's no longer top 10, it's top seven. But you know, one of the tips was use TensorBoard right in Colab. So for, for those of you who are not familiar with TensorBoard, which would be perfectly understandable, TensorBoard is a, is a library from, uh, from Google. It's sort of like a dashboard for TensorFlow. Um, and it's easy to use right within Colab. And you know the reason I left this in here for, for this presentation is that it's actually a good demonstration about how uh, output cells can render arbitrary HTML and have interactivity. So what you're looking at, to be clear here, there's an input cell in Colab and then the output cell. The output cell is something that would normally take a full website. You know, there's like tabs within tabs, there's, you know, interactivity, there's a bunch of charts. You can actually like scroll down this thing in, in, in a real Jupyter notebook and you'd have tons and tons of in, <laughs> interactivity and functionality. So it's basically like an entire web app that's just running in, a, uh, in an output cell in Colab. In fact, we recently built a way so that you can Pop that out into a separate tab too, if you want. Uh, another tip is if you know, if for whatever reason you don't want to use a hosted runtime, you know, in Google Cloud, you maybe you like your own rig, you have your GPU that you like, or for for privacy reasons, you don't want that data up in the cloud. Yeah, you can use the Colab front end, which is basically a Jupyter notebook editor that Google wrote. Uh, it's not the the normal Jupyter front end, uh, but you can use our our front end with a local runtime running on your machine. Uh, pretty easy to do. It's just within that connect. You just connect your local runtime instead of hosted runtime. Another really cool thing is uh, the Colab scratch pad. So as I mentioned, when you, when you create a notebook in Colab, it's automatically saved to your drive account. But you, sometimes you don't want to end up with titles like, you know, untitled one, <laughs> unti you know, notebooks with names like untitled 112. Uh, and so you can actually use the scratch pad for that. That's just this URL. Anybody can go to this URL at any time. And that's basically like a special Colab notebook that is not automatically saved to your drive account. Although if you end up doing something you don't want to lose there, you can also click copy to drive right there. Uh, this is a really just a performance thing, but uh, you know you can import data very easily from drive and you can mount your drive, right? Uh, but if you want really, really high performance, something that, uh, that can be helpful to do is actually copy the data from your drive into the Colab VM, because the Colab VM is, uh, is a high performance disk that's, uh, you know, uh, right in the VM. And so um, that's especially useful if you're dealing with huge amounts of data, especially image data. Like you don't want to be reading a, reading image files from Drive as your, you know, let's say training machine learning model. Way better to bring that over to the, the Colab VM. Uh, results in substantial speed ups, even if you're only reading the data through once. Um, another little feature is uh, to mind your, your memory. That's both uh, your RAM and your disk. There's a little display there showing how much is used. You, know, you don't want to run out of RAM because then you you crash and your runtime is dead. You have to create a new runtime. You lose all your variables. So it's really good to keep track of, uh, of how much memory you're using. Another, another tip is to actually close your tabs when you're done with your work. So when you close a tab in Colab, uh, it will disconnect you from the, from the underlying VM. You know, one day we might actually provide uh, background execution, but right now, when you close the tab, you're connected, disconnected from the underlying VM. And that's not only great for us because it frees up the, the resources where then your VM is deleted and the, 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 the metal is, be able, is recycled into a new uh, VM for, uh, for another user or maybe, maybe for you at a later time. But it also benefits you because sort of invisible to you is, a, is a sort of a resource limits within Colab that's associated with your Google account. And so if you use Colab extremely heavily, 
uh, you'll eventually get error message an error message that says sorry no no back end no back end is available to you in other words no no vm or runtime is available to you right now because you've been, you've been using it too much you've been put in sort of a timeout uh, and so for that reason anything that sort of conserves resources uh, actually benefits you because it it makes it less likely that you're going to run into any resource limits within Colab. So close your tabs when you're done with your work and encourage your students to do so. It's it's good for them too. Uh, and last one, which is extremely relevant for machine learning, maybe a little less so depending on what type of data science you're doing, uh, is to only use the GPUs when, when they're actually needed for your work. Uh, again, GPUs are expensive on the back end. And so when you're connected to a GPU, you're more rapidly appro approaching the resource uh, you, you know your personal resource limits uh, within Colab, and so it's great to uh, to only use a, a, a standard runtime. In fact, I bet you if I switch over here, well, um, you know at some point there'll be a little message that says, you know, it looks like you're connected to a GPU, but you're not actually using your GPU. You know, consider using a standard runtime. Um, now, with all that said, you know, sort of like minding your memory and uh, and you know closing your tabs and and uh, and don't use GPUs if they're not needed for your work. We do get a lot of feedback from people who say, actually, you know, we want the opposite. We want even faster GPUs. We want more access to them. We want, uh, you know, more lenient resource limits. We want longer run times, longer idle timeouts, longer maximum VM lifetimes within Colab. And we want even more memory, so we just don't run out of memory. Uh, we do hear that feedback uh, a lot. And so recently we launched uh, uh, something called Colab Pro. Basically, just a premium tier of Colab. It's ten bucks a month and gets you priority access to faster GPUs, longer runtime, so more lenient idle timeouts and longer maximum VM lifetimes, uh, and more memory. It's available only in the U.S. for now, uh, for now but we're uh, rapidly working to make it available in, in more countries since it's uh, it's been a, a big success. Uh, you might wonder what's next in Colab, and uh, you know one thing I, I find myself saying sometimes to reassure people is, first of all, Colab is not going away. I feel like Google killed Google Reader like ten years ago, and now everybody's uh, Google is constantly paying the price there. But uh, Colab is not going away, and the free version of Colab is not going away. The free version of Colab and Colab Pro are going to continue to coexist, and we're we're investing in both of them uh, in terms of in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, and as for feature development, you know this is where I would say. You know, what do you think should come next in Colab? You, you send feedback via the via Colab, or you can file a GitHub issue, or tweet at me at Tim Novikov or at Google Colab on Twitter. There's many channels for uh, for sending us feedback, and you know, really, I, I in some sense, although I'm the product manager for Colab, in some sense I don't decide what we build next. Uh, users do. We listen very carefully to our users, and uh, you know, look at look at uh, our metrics and basically build whatever we think uh, is what the users, uh, our users want us to build next. And so you can actually influence that by, by letting us know what you want us to build next. Um, that's it for me. So thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot. Awesome, thank you. Um, I have a few questions to get started, uh, but we can see what comes up in the chat as well. I guess um, for me, the most pressing uh, issue right now is um, people are stuck at home. Students are stuck at home. They can't go to the lab. They can't have their GSI walk around and help them learn to code. Um, there's a lot of alienation. There's a lot of lack of support for people. Um, what's your uh, product sort of like vision or play to how to do distance learning in a coding space? How are we going to support? Car. Yeah. How are we going to support people in the COVID era? Yeah. So. Um... You know, from our perspective at Microsoft, it, with code spaces and code, we have a product called LiveShare. So LiveShare allows you to do both voice, video, and collaboratively coding through the same environment. So that's probably been, you know, one of our biggest tools that we've seen really actively utilized within the COVID period. You know, it creates pair programming straight away, project group collaboration. It supports Jupyter directly, so you run a Jupyter notebook within code or code spaces. Again, you know, you can do multi-party collaboration. Again, it's completely free. So, you know, it's a, it's a free solution. Um, 
so that's been a real big killer the other real interesting one that's been a huge success is like whiteboarding so the ability for students to collabor collaboratively whiteboard in the same experience so both do code and then discuss the scenario and draw it out again visual studio supports extensions extensions are produced by the community you know your team at berkeley have produced the extension for okpy okay um so you can do okpy okay submissions both online and offline so again we're seeing extensions being a key key play in that whole collaborative approach. Philip, <clears throat> David, Tim, you want to talk into this? Yeah. So uh, from from Volcarian's perspective, um, we've been online for a very long time. Right? We are in. <clears throat> we probably have you know hundreds of thousands of learners that have uh, gone through and used our labs in uh, in MOOCs. Right. For example, we, we've got Intro to Python, we've got uh, Data Sciences. A lot of courses have been uh, online already, right? And then, of course, the residential courses um, more recently have moved online. I think one of the most interesting uh, aspects was actually exams, you know, as soon as COVID hit, and it's towards the, the middle to the end of the, the semester, and we were getting calls left and right saying, okay, how am I going to handle, you know, assessments for, 100 students or 50 students or, you know, and, you know, I can't run a 200, you know, uh, seat in class exam anymore. And so, you know, as I mentioned, there's the whole idea of synchronous or asynchronous exams and being able to to support a lot of different, um, you know, ways to to manage and and uh, provide flexibility to instructors to to work with the with the students. Um, we are looking and uh, working on collaboration. So right now, the collaboration for us is is limited to team projects, and um, and then for instructors to go visit any student's workspace with a click of a button. But we don't we don't have the, the live real time collaboration yet. But that's 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 coming. Do you have any? Does Vocarium have any like integration of chat or integration of comments or? So we have integration of comments. Uh, so essentially, you know, there's the, the whole concept of uh, peer reviews. So once a submission has been, um, you know, submitted and, and closed, then it can go into a peer review process and, uh, and the instructor can either manually assign or dynamically allow each student to review one or more other students' work, right? And, uh, and there would be a peer review process. Right. And then part of that peer review process would be to actually execute the uh, the submission or to provide comments um, either straight in line with the code or uh, or 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 separately and then also uh, optionally provide grades so they can actually contribute to a uh, another student's grade. Great, thanks. Sure. Philip, I think this might be one of your strengths. <laughs> Yeah, uh, like I, I was confused. I don't think we have actually anything on the other side of the spectrum. Maybe like we are all um, cloud first. Um, there's real, real time collaboration and comments. Um, so we've seen a surge of universities coming to us after um, sort of COVID hit. Um, and yeah, so I think the the product was kind of set. Um, um, in a way that we we're kind of this is these are the first class citizens for us uh, like remote classes remote teams and and everything um what needs to maybe which would maybe needs this uh, real-time feedback loop cool um do you have any does deep note have it, like examples of where you know people are coding in a team or coding together or pair coding or um, so there, there's an upcoming uh, case study coming up uh, from from Cambridge, um, and I think besides that, maybe um, there are certainly some some videos of people doing hackathons in DeepNode. I know there's Google Hash Code. We had loads of teams using DeepNode for that, um, cool. and uh, yeah, we have we have our uh, like our publishing platform, which certainly um, features some of these showcases, or you can simply um, create a new project and like within a within 10 seconds you can have as many collaborators as you need. Cool. Tim, I guess you're 
also a collaborative tool. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess my answer to that would be, uh, sorry, I was a little distracted from Phil, but it seems like there's a good chance that it's similar to his, you know, like Co Colab is a collaborative tool, that's why it's called that. Um, Colab is, all, you know, is also what powers the interactive Python and data science within Google, which is, you know, has like 80,000 software engineers and probably 10 or 20,000 uh, data scientists or something across hundreds of offices. Uh, it's also how, you know, the Colab team obviously uses Colab uh, to uh, to track, uh, you know, usage of Colab. Um, you know, that's sort of what we use for dashboarding. It's It's always been meant for collaboration and in some sense, COVID-19 didn't really change anything at all for us, it's, except, you know, uh, maybe create a little bit more demand. You know, Google continues to use Colab. We, we continue to use Colab. Courses continue to use Colab. Uh, it's just, it, this is what uh, what it was meant for. Awesome. All right, my next question is about grading, which is like a significant pain point. Uh, there are, you know, a hundred people on this call that don't really know uh, what they would do about grading. Um, you know, to the extent uh, the tools are there, they could, you know, like otter something you just pull in, like you should be able to pull the package in at will. Um, but there's a little bit of like an on-ramp for each product and like a learning curve. And uh, I just wanted to know if you guys had comments about how your solution might help a new instructor uh, enact an auto gate auto grading scheme workflow for them. So it's it's an interesting one. I think you know again it depends. So it depends on what level you want to take grading to. So you know you can install Otter, which is super. Build localized tests, which is super. You know there's a great tool there that the Otter team has built to actually help you create um, unit tests. Again, you know, they are visible unit tests though. So that's something we've done in the foundations of data science. We have a set of number of uh, unit tests which are open, but it's just that that iterative coding testing. So from a learning pedagogy perspective, allowing the students to test against an engine to understand if they're doing it right. Now, if you look at it from a pedagogy perspective, is giving a student an unlimited number of gradings a good thing? There's lots of research that says yes, allowing a student to continually test is a good experience so i think that's a great thing then you have like the secondary grading which is the submission so end submission grade and again you know it really comes down to how you want to build your end submission grade and what levels you want to take it to again otter and the team and okay pi and the team have done great work with grade scope so you can submit to grade scope it does that process and again you know from a microsoft perspective we sort of allowed that functionality again against all different languages with GitHub Actions. So GitHub Classroom now includes a unit-based testing solution for any software development language. And it's again of how you want to build your unit tests and what work engines you want to be in that process, whether you want to do the assessment piece, the submission piece, or that continuous attainment piece. So again, loads, you know, I'm super impressed with the work that Otter Grader have done and Chris and, and the team. You know, it's going to get a, a big amount of kudos and support from us. We're, you know, we're using it now with Microsoft Learn because we see it's just a, a really nice, lightweight implementation that can go into the dev container image, be there and deployable and allow that experience to happen. So, again, depending on what level you want to go to, if you want to do the whole plagiarism stuff, there's Moss and other things, and there might be other things in the works. So I'm sure as vendors are all building things. David? Yeah, in terms of grading, um, we actually uh, are using MB Grader uh, today. And uh, I saw in chat someone was asking about Otter uh, as well. And uh, and that's something that we're looking at. Uh, with regards to MB Grader, uh, I can show you real quickly. It's a very, very simple um, interface. And a lot of our professors are essentially using this to, um, to set things up, right? And so, this is the Volcarium environment as a um, as a student, and inside this environment, um, you know, this is just Jupiter, and uh, and the instructor may provide some cells and ask for some code, right? And these are already filled out, but uh, but if we go down over here, 
they they may ask you for for an answer for um, for for question number five, and uh, and these cells are kind of obscured for the student from a stu from an instructor perspective though, and this is the instructor view. Um, each of these cells, there will be auto graded cells. For example, this is an auto graded cell, and these are hidden tests. Okay, and so these are this is a test that uh, that's testing question number one. Right, and they also can provide a solution. And so when it goes through our release process, and we have a release notebooks, right, process, and essentially we will extract all the rubric items straight out of the, the notebook. We'll overwrite our uh, generated grading scripts, and we'll also generate the HTML feedback for for the students. And so when we do that release, then the students will not have all this. But because this is this is in here as as pragmas and stuff. The instructors can actually go uh, and run this and uh, and check their work before they do a release. Okay, and so when the student goes and does a submission, then we do checkpoint the the notebook, send it to our grading server, runs, and uh, and then it essentially replaces those elements, the auto graded cell with the um, the the checks that uh, were were built into the teacher view. Okay, and uh, you know, it sends it to the grading server, and the students can get feedback right away. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they can do unlimited submissions, or we can actually limit the submissions. We can also limit the rate of submissions, so students are not gaming the system by you know just trying random stuff. So hopefully that uh, gives a view of you know I think everyone else did the demo. I should have done the demo in the first place, but uh, hopefully that gives you guys a view of uh, what this looks like. Uh, Philip, do you got anything to comment about grading? Um, yeah, uh, well, um, not not that much. We we don't really support like uh, some built-in custom auto grading feature. Um, we um, so what we've seen working for smaller classes, maybe sub fifteen people. It's simply people uh, grab their links and send them over to the instructor or the professor who commented. Um, because at that scale, maybe that's easier than writing all the grading solutions uh, and setting them up. Um, for larger classes, um, we um, something what we did at Cambridge was uh, implement a custom. Um, I'm not sure now whether it was in Cambridge, but what we did uh, at the, for one course is that we implemented a custom um, sort of an endpoint, and when the when the student would finish the, the assignment or a notebook, um, they would simply run run the last cell and this would submit um, all of the answers um, and then some like a server would process this and generate maybe a report for the for the professor. Um, students are also able to generate uh, PDFs out of the notebooks. It, uh, sometimes uh, reports are also graded so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, nothing, nothing like um, MB Creator because that requires uh, some, uh, if I believe correctly, that requires custom um, front end functionality, which we haven't implemented yet. Um, so yeah, now, now more of like these um, um, cell level solutions. Yeah, I would second exactly what, what Philip said. Um, same, we don't have a, yeah, we have an integration with Google Classroom, but you know, realistically, I would say for small, it's basically exactly what Philip said. You know, for small classes, just you know, you know just deal with links. Uh, you know, if you want a bigger thing, listen, v, like VMs and VMs are these can accommodate arbitrary Python, and they uh, they're a Python endpoint that can communicate with other endpoints. A uh, bunch of LMSs actually do have uh, API hooks that you can use. Uh, if not, you know, uh, it's relatively simple to to write something that that can process these things. Uh, as you see fit, um, you know, what's nice about Jupyter, in my opinion, is that it's extremely flexible, right? It's, you know, the level of abstraction of Jupyter is not, you know, da data science visualization or machine learning or learning to program. It's oh, really arbit essentially arbitrary Python. And so take it, folks are, are best served basically taking advantage of that and, uh, and uh, integrating it with, with custom solutions. I've definitely seen some some great examples where professors, like Philip said, have a cell that 
just submits <laughs> submits the 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 contents to the to the um, either to the LMS or to something that the that the computer science professor has set up. Great, thank you. Um, so another question I have that's um, sort of related is like the level of support you would get from different solutions, um, like asking questions or figuring out, you know, how to do an implementation or something that works. Um, so if somebody's a new instructor and they need help getting onboarded with a platform, like they're going to invest a certain amount of time in learning that platform and making that platform be part of their workflow. Um, you know, what's like advantages of your solution for, uh, you know, making it worthwhile to like build a workflow around it and like what sort of support is there? Yeah, so, so for Volcarium, um, <clears throat> we we do obviously um, handle a lot of professors. Uh, depends on, you know, the complexity of um, of what they're trying to do. So, you know, getting onto a platform is very easy. Um, if they're just trying to do auto grading in Jupyter, you know, as I mentioned and I showed, it's super easy. If they're trying to do some more complex or customize uh, the grading, um, it, it could get a little a little dicey, right? Um, you know, there's there's you know if you're going to do R, for example, um, we do have an auto grading solution, but it's not as elegant as uh, MB Grader. Uh, if you're going to do cybersecurity, yes, yep. Oh, there, there's... Come to the next panel for auto grader and R integration. Sorry, keep going. Excellent. Yeah, and if you're doing cybersecurity or you're you're doing cloud computing, then then there's a lot of customization that might might need to work. And we do have a lot of options um, specifically, like these are all built for instructors who have come and said, okay, I, I need, you know, um, you know, as I mentioned, the a slip day budget, right? And now how do you configure that? Right. Or I need to provide um, the ability to uh, to grade on a curve or to to um, to have a, a scaling sort of um, you know uh, late submission policy, right? And so so we build all that in because you know our our audience are instructors who are trying to um, trying to assess the, the the students. So you know not just the technical part of the assignments and the grading, but also the the overall infrastructure. Um, I think has a lot of power and allows people to, to do a lot of different things. Um, and so we will handhold the, uh, you know, the course creator to, to build it out the way they need. Great. Philip, yeah, did you yeah. want to say something? Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe I can uh, speak about this a bit. So, um, um, yeah, so there is certainly some support we could, uh, we can provide in deep note. Um, we're still a relatively small team, um, but the, what I like to sort of think is that the, the core is basically Jupyter. So um, there's loads of resources available for Jupyter itself. Um, so you can already build really, and, and like Deep Node is simply building on top of Jupyter. So there's not that much um, um, different, like, like the behavior is not that much different. So you can already build a really strong foundation with that. On top of that, we have a couple of um, research re resources, which I linked in the slash education page. Um, it has a guide on how to set up a team and a course basically in deep note. I, and I basically demonstrated the whole thing um, during this, um, uh, during this uh, panel. So, um, and, and all of the confusions maybe, which we gather from users or people setting up courses, we update our, docs regularly so that's also another great resource and well, lastly obviously if there is any um, confusion we are really happy to to uh, have a chat partner with um, uh, with the individual uh, people uh, responsible for setting up the course um, and and yeah listen to their feedback and work out something what what would basically uh, mean the, the course is um, easily accessible and works nicely for both the professor and the students. Sounds good. Yeah, from the CoLab perspective, I would basically point people to Stack Overflow. I mean, CoLab is uh, sort of operating at Google scale. We 
get probably you know on the order of a hundred feedbacks a week. We read all of them, but it's not it's not practical to to respond to all of them. Um, there's uh, we have an active GitHub page. If you find a uh, you know a bug, uh, if you have a usage question, we we point people to Stack Overflow. I think there's about two thousand answered Stack Overflow questions about Colab. A lot of answers are up there already, frankly. Um, you know, a lot of answers you can answer by Googling, uh, but uh, basically encourage people to to, uh, to ask on Stack Overflow uh, because that's the likely the fastest place to get an answer. You know, to, to tie it up, frankly, Colab does not offer customer support. Uh, it's just not, not at all practical at our scale. Yeah. So um, for Microsoft, so we have multiple, uh, uh, um, type of system. So we are covered by documentation, blog posts, um, and uh, there's no problem to go through everything. And this is if you are looking for uh, the way how to code thing or how to configure thing. And on top of that, we are trying to build tools that uh, uh, are um, built in a pedagogical language. So, so uh, on top of the coding itself, for, for, uh, for example, uh, build an assignment in a notebook and stuff like that. We also uh, offer tools that uh, speak a pedagogical language, which is basically uh, what is an assignment and, and what is an exercise and a lab um, and a quiz uh, uh, and, and all of that. So we are covered uh, both in these both uh, uh, areas. Cool. Um, we want to look through the chat. There's a there's a bunch happening in the chat. Uh, different. Uh, yeah, lots of questions in the chat. Yeah, Anybody have... want to pull something out of the chat to respond to verbally? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that one. So, I saw a lot earlier. So, somebody asked about uh, our support in Colab. Uh, you know, it's it's a little known fact that Colab actually does support R and also supports Swift. Uh, but they're not really first class citizens. You know, our primary bread and butter is Python. Uh, and in fact, at, at this point, to create a Python, uh, an R or Swift uh, runtime, you basically have to make a copy of an existing R or Swift uh, notebook. Uh, basically, um, you know, as to my last point, if you, if you, you know, just Google like how to create an R notebook in Colab, uh, you'll find that information. You basically, the basic idea is you got to make a copy of an existing notebook. That has the associate uh, appropriate metadata to connect to the runtime, but uh, but we basically see much much higher adoption in in Python, uh, and that's where our our main focus is, to the point where we've uh, we've even uh, eliminated the the ways to naturally create a Swift or R notebook in Colab. So again, one I think one of the key ones again, this is probably for Chris and Eric is just around that whole creation of tests you know it's I think we've all struggled <laughs> we've all seen it is I want to test a student on how to do something where do I start in terms of building that test so you know things have got much easier now with with the creation tools but I think again it's open source people so if you build a test let's create a test bank repository in Otter that you can just go this is a test for this and again I think it really comes back to that what is a private test versus what is a public test to allow users to, to practice and to learn? And I think, you know, you'll never have private tests being shown from anyone because that just devalues the whole the whole course. You know, people brain dump things. So, you know, but I think a bank of public tests would be so cool. Yes. <laughs> Let's use a repo. <laughs> yeah, so that's something that's come up in the adoption panel was this idea of like making, you know, um, uh, a repo for all the different things people are making in different places. But if it's done right, they're all in the right format and they're interoperable and they're plug in. It actually can long term, I think it can help with cheating, right? The more test questions you have, the more you can randomize. Uh, exams out of a, a bigger bank of questions, the more you can um, get around cheating. Um, I have one question that I have to ask because of my colleagues from the Jupiter uh, team who uh, I would say, how, how can I say this? 
What is your company doing to contribute back to the Jupiter project? Loads. <laughs> yes, yeah, so from a Microsoft perspective, the majority of our Python team, our notebooks team, our core contributors to Jupyter. So people like Safia has implemented Interact. So she, you know, she's a lead developer Interact. We've got people like Tanya Allard, who's part of the main Jupyter community again, who produce a lot of the Jupyter Pi SciPy resources. So pretty much everything we do now from an engineering group is OSS. So everything that we've done around data rate is OSS. You know, you can go and download that repo, upload it to your Jupyter Hub, run it in a code spaces environment, take it and run it in whatever environment you want, because you know, we are about skilling of the students and skilling of the workforce of the future. Um, and again, you know, we are, we can only be better because we collaborate openly with with you know with the community. So everything we do is OSS. Everything. David, Philip, you got a statement. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, <laughs> we we have not contributed uh, back to the Jupiter community, although you know obviously that's uh, that's something we we should be looking into. Philip, no, you got a pathway for yeah, your product? Yeah. Sorry, no, I, I got confused about the order. Um, so so far, I think the there might have been a couple of upstream contributions, but we are also not open source. Uh, we're definitely thinking about this because Jupyter is an open standard and uh, we definitely want to support that. But right now, sadly, also, I don't have much to demonstrate. Um, for Google, I'm not uh, sure what the right answer is. I, I do think you know, Google's a huge, uh, huge company and I don't track all, all that's going on through the open source office. I think that Google has made some sort of uh, financial contributions to like the the like parent project to Jupiter or something like that, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, when I joined Colab one year ago, I think there was there had sort of recently been a little bit of uh, sort of a, a question about this online. Uh, oh, here it is. My colleague is saying uh, there's fairly significant funding towards num focus. Um, there was a question about sort of uh, the 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 front end of Colab, so uh, and why why isn't that sort of contributed back to Jupiter? And the the answer that I understood is that basically Google does not or Colab does not at all use the Jupiter front end. So we re rewrote our own thing, like similar to DeepNote uh, in, in JavaScript. In our case, the the architecture of it was mandated by uh, Google's like central security team, where each each um, Output cell had to be its own iframe. And these sort of technical issues like this make it so that basically the, the answer that I heard is that basically none of the code that ever gets written for Colab would uh, would work its way into Jupyter uh, in, in any natural way at all. So it's just not practical from a, from a technical uh, perspective to sort of contribute sort of Colab back into Jupyter. Uh, but I think there's financial contributions towards, uh, towards num focus is one thing. And, you know, I, th I think another sort of common sense answer is that, you know, Colab is, you know, does use the Jupyter protocol. And so there's uh, tons and tons of uh, notebooks that are being uh, created in, in Colab and then taken into Jupyter project and being used elsewhere in the ecosystem. And it's made possible in part by the, you know, the cloud infrastructure that Google is making available for free to users. Uh, you know, I can't, can't release any numbers, but so an enormous number of people use Jupyter um, thanks to the the free computing environment that uh, that Colab provides. So that maybe like another answer would be I, I wouldn't overlook that aspect of it. You know that that that's also important and and uh, so indirectly drives uh, drives contributions to the uh, to the Jupyter project. Okay, that's it for my questions. I just want to put one last thing. I mean, suppose that you were looking at 50 future data science instructors in the face and you wanted to give like, you know, a pitch of why your your product was the way to go. Uh, you know, what's your how do you how do you sum that up? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Sorry. Uh, you're looking at 50 or 75 future data science instructors. Uh, they're watching you. 
what's your pitch to them of, uh, you know, why they should take your pathway as the workflow? So I think it's choice. You know, number one, it's how you want to build your course. I think, you know, cloud services are changing every three weeks, you know, so to try and keep up to date with screenshots, images, et cetera, is super difficult. That's why we built Learn, um, number one. You know, that was a discussion I was having with Eric last year when we were thinking about building it is, you know, what's your pain points? And most educators can't build tutorials fast enough or keep them refreshed. So bite-sized learning is another one. And then the third one, which Eric loves, is gamification, is you've got to make it enjoyable for the students. Um, and again, you know, the, the real key one for me is about demonstrable skills. So that ability for students to build a portfolio of what they've learned and again ideally build potentially you know professional certification pathways and get pathways you know across aws google and microsoft because that is what's going to be that usp to your career in the future and i think the, this year has really just sort of made that huge for for most universities is, you know why should you go why should your children go off and do a degree at x when they were going to be sat at home paying the same price for the same experience and i think that's going to be the big challenge for all of us in this, you know, all of us in this virtual room is, you know, for next year, our, our annual cycles of compute will completely look different than they've ever looked before. I asked you to run some stats yesterday to say, you know, what was data rate like now versus the same time this year? Because, you know, you've got students sat in China who are logging in at 2 a.m. U.S. time, whereas before you had idle compute. And now that's going to cost you potentially three to four times more in compute resources than they did last year. And the students are paying the same amount. And is the student experience the same? So you've got to work hard to make sure that student experience is A1. So for me, it's blended learning, bite-sized resources, and more importantly, the ability to, to do that assessment piece continually. Is, did the students do that piece of homework? Because you know, working remotely is very different than going to a lecture every day. So again, the whole, ecosystem of what infrastructure you have around that classroom is, is key. Just to add to that, um, open source. Uh, our strategy is to open source everything. Uh, we basically use the community to help us and basically advance things uh, and make sure that things still work. As Lee said, things are changing in the sp speed of light. Um, and, and therefore, being open uh, and enabling anyone to uh, 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 take care of things that uh, need to be taken care of uh, and exposing that to the whole community. Uh, this is basically our strategy uh, on top of everything Lee said. David, you want to give an elevator pitch? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> the the challenge for for instructors today are, you know, if they're if they're trying to teach a new data science course or trying to build it out, um, you know, the speed at which they can do so, right? You know, we, we are all busy people. And, um, you know, I think it's great having the resource like Data8 to, to start with, but also the, the platform is, you know, it needs to be push button, right? It can't be, you know, go and install a, you know, uh, a Jupyter Hub server and even booting up the, the littlest Jupyter, Jupyter Hub. I think, you know, being able to, to, to do that is, is great, but also, you know, being able to manage it for, for growing populations, right? Because the data science is not going away. It's, it's growing all the different, uh, it's, you know, starting to become a general education, you know, uh, requirement. So being able to scale it and, uh, and, you know, and then also tying it into, into the, the uh, educational sort of goals, right? And of course we talked about assessment, talked about, enrollment, talk about LTI. There's a lot of pieces that need to come together to, to do that, right? And, uh, you know, I think that's that's where, you know, something like Volcarium, where we have the, everything rolled up together and it's very quick and easy to deploy, to scale, and then, you know, and then engage the, the students, right? And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Philip, Philip you got an elevator pitch? Yeah, I practiced that so many times. Um, so um, um, you're in that well, stage of funding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, well, actually, um, so I think all of the solutions which were presented today, they um, all got their their use cases. Um, 
I think, uh, what I like to think that deep node is the, it's very easy on the, like on the user experience, you don't know, need to know what's a deployment machine, cloud instance, anything. It's a, it's a more like a living document, which you share with someone. Um, you don't need to think about it in terms of maybe even notebooks sometimes. Um, so, um, yeah, I think for aiming for the, the ease of experience, um, and maybe perhaps the like the usability also not within a, an educational setting, but also like a professional setting. It I think it can nicely transform um, further. Yeah. Thank, awesome. Thank you, Philip. Tim, you want the last word? <laughs> That's funny because elevator pitches used to be my thing. I'm an entrepreneur. I had a, a you know an iPhone app startup that I sold to Google, and elevator pitches used to be my uh, absolute bread and butter. But, uh, well, but no longer. How about you? Per how about you pretend that you're not the elephant in the room, and you're like some hungry young uh, entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I think all the, you know, I actually just uh, sort of agree with all the other, um, the all the other elevator pitches actually, you know, everything has its, uh, everything has its use case, uh, you know, for Colab, uh, you know, I, like, I used to actually teach iPhone app development at, at, uh, at Cornell where I created the course there. And by far the hardest part of that was debugging environments for my students. You know, getting their provisioning profiles to work with Xcode and stuff. I mean, the uh, teaching of the content was pretty straightforward. I could largely wing it, um, and in fact, I did actually largely wing it. Um, but uh, but what there was just no um, no easy solution for was dealing with the kids who are who are like uh, you know, excuse me, Dr. Novikov, the you know my 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 code just won't run. It's saying there's some sort of build error. And you know, the thing about Colab is that it it just works, right? You can just you get, you get a URL for your course notes, send it out. It's going to work for your students too. You can do, you know, live coding. I used to do live coding of an iPhone app in each of my courses. And at, at the last minute of the course, I would just take my Xcode project and send it out. Uh, but then there would still be like, again, these like sort of build issues uh, for, for the students often. This was a, many years ago, the ecosystem wasn't as slick. But, you know, for if I was teaching data science in Colab, this is, or if I was teaching data science today, um, this is what I would do. You know, I would write my code in Colab. I would do live coding probably for for the course, and then at the end of the course, I would just send out the notebook, and then everybody got it. And maybe at night, I would clean up the code and then send out a clean version. That's actually what I used to do with my Xcode projects, and yeah, it it just works. It works for you. It works for the students. You can tweet it out. You know, it's just uh, it's just very very low friction. And in awesome. fact, in fact, that's why I joined Colab. When I when I I, you know, I went to grad school actually for for applied math at Cornell and um, had to go through a computational methods class in Python. And at the time, I basically didn't didn't code and had no technical background. And I remember when I got a new laptop, just having to crawl in shame back to my old instructor, like I don't understand whether I had Python installed, you know. Uh, and it was just really really uh, sort of shameful for me. And when I saw Colab, I was like, oh my gosh, this would have solved all my students' as a, as problems as a student, would have solved all my problems as an, as an instructor later on. And, you know, it, it just works. That, that's actually why I joined Colab. It's, it's just, uh, it works for what it is. Nice. All right, I'm going to have my last word. On that note, I just want to say, like, you know, what I think about Jupiter in some ways is there's this really cool cultural thing from the science side about reproducibility and that sort of meeting the computer science side. So the scientists were like, we can't have this thing where computation ends up different for different researchers. It's just not working for science. So let's build a thing so that we can make sure that the science runs on each, you know, in every setting. And that's turns out also to be first best for you know computer coding in a way like you know make sure that code runs on all environments and then i think that they built jupiter for you know computational reproducibility but then it had these crazy advantages for education let's make sure that the teacher the gsi the student all have exactly the same outcome um so it's really cool to think about like this cultural shift that we're in towards like reproducible code has like you know allowed things to permeate out really well and has really really awesome network effects 
We are the network. Thank you guys so much for an awesome panel. Totally exceeded my expectations. Thanks for everybody for leaning in. So much great innovation in this space. I need to go to the next meeting, but if you guys want to stay in and answer questions or um, uh, you know, give people feedback, um, I really, really, really appreciate your time. I would love to keep in touch with everybody. I We have tons of people that come to us asking questions, and I would love to be able to like you know, refer you out to people. Um, so um, thanks so much. I really appreciate your coming and I really appreciate building up this, this form of a social network between people working in the space. Yeah, I thanks, have a few minutes, but I can stick around for a few thanks, more. Hey, since nobody's asking any questions, I'll ask Philip a question. So, how did uh, what's the uh, what's the origin story for for Deep Note? Uh, oh, um, so uh, let me think. Uh, I like it would be like pure frustration with any other uh, when setting up like data science tooling in larger companies. Um, only half of the team had to do this; they all hated it. So. Um, so they kind of we're all working at larger companies setting up data science infrastructure and decided this could be just done man, yeah many of like at least they were kind of either tasked with like some some tooling around data pipelines or mm -hmm. um um or simply they were data scientists themselves so um yeah these were all these were all kind of the, the pain points which we all felt and yeah then, then deep node um, was born um yeah, by the way, cool presentation about Colab. I really enjoyed that. Of course. Um, yeah, you based fine. in London, Phil? Are you based in London with the rest of the team? Or? Um, so I'm actually not anymore. I used to be based in London. I studied there. Uh, now I'm based in, in Prague. Are you at UCL? Um, you I was study? at Imperial. Imperial. I'm sure, I'm sure I know you from somewhere. I was going to yeah, say, I'm yeah, sure I recognize you. I was like, I know him from either UCL or Imperial. Yeah, we, we definitely met. I remember that a couple of Microsoft hackathons. Yeah, Imperial hack. I was like, I yeah. know that guy. I know the name. I was like, cool. Um, oh, it's great to see people when they like graduate and they get into the industry. It's awesome. Um, so um, I think there were a couple of um, questions. I know maybe. Um, um, there's, um, there's one for you, Tim, actually, it seems like collab works for collaboration and, oh, sorry, that's actually for me. So what does deep note add over that? Um, that's actually, uh, a really good question. And, um, so, um, I'm not sure to what extent I would like to talk about this with like, uh, Tim present. But um, <laughs> I, can, I can give people, give people and I, you know, my heart is always with startups. You know, I'm a fundamentally a startup person, even though I'm, you know, uh, temporarily inconvenienced at a large company. Um, you know, one deep note actually has uh, real time collaboration, if I, if I recall correctly, um, or at least it, that was true on the marketing site, um, which is something Colab used to have, but no longer does. That, that's that's true, right? Like if uh, if uh, two people are collaborating on a notebook and deep note, if somebody's coding, can the other person sort of see that coding and in real time and do comments show up sort of right away? Um, yeah, so so or actually like I, I would be really interested in like what did you did you like decide to drop uh, the real time collaboration? Because yeah, that's that's kind of a, one of the selling points we, we use yeah. a lot. Um, it's it's a big deal. So um, yeah, I was just wondering which, whether you had any like reasons for this. Uh, there was just like a sort of a, like a deprecation of an internal API and so uh, you know, it, it's not actually it wasn't used enormously you know if we, if we really needed to build it we would uh, we would uh, we would rebuild it I guess uh, but um, but it just wasn't as high priority as other stuff but uh, there's definitely like a lot of sort of sadness like oh do you remember when we had real-time collaboration and uh, you know definitely I would say the one one answer that uh, <laughs> they can give while I'm still here because I'll, I'll just answer it is you know real-time collaboration is something that uh, that deep note has for collaboration that Colab does and with Colab, you know, like comments will will show up to the other person in like 30 seconds and 
it, you know, uh, changes get merged in, in, at, a, at a slower, slower, slower timeline. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, and like, like, yeah, the, the, there's the real time collaboration aspect. There's like, we could maybe start naming the features like one by one. I don't know. Maybe there's like, I don't know. I know that Collab has the execution history. We don't, we don't have that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, we got something like terminals or variable explorer. So these are, uh, they are use case specific. So the best you can usually do is take a look at both tools and see what works for, for you the best as an individual. Yeah. Uh, I see a question. Tim, while Python is the main focus of Colab, R does run perfectly. Why not make this information more available? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, the the team already has its hands full with Python, and don't, you know, the more you sort of put the information front and center, the more there's sort of an onus to fully support it. And, and if, you know, R works perfectly now, you know, that is great. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if it, if it starts decaying over time, you know, we don't want it to sort of reflect badly on, on Colab overall, which isn't to say that we don't support it at all. Actually, we do support it internally. A lot of people at Google do use R, but, um, you know, it's it's similar to Swift. Yeah, if we if we saw huge uptake in R or Swift in the um, you know numerical computing and uh, interactive interactive development uh, data science world, um, we would we would probably focus more on it and maybe make it more front and center. You know, one thing I do sometimes I'll go to Google Trends, which I, I think is public. Everybody can see that and just look at the search results, or rather look at uh, yeah, like search volume for things like you know. Python versus R, or like Python tutorial versus R tutorial. And while R, like everybody knows, it's got an extremely uh, passionate uh, group of adherents in the statistics world and, and data science as well, uh, you know, realistically, like overall holistically, Python is growing like that and R is kind of going like that. And, you know, it's, that's, that's the reality. Like Colab's not going to not going to change that itself. So, you know, back to the what I ended my own presentation on is we sort of follow follow users. Uh, not the other way around. And so, when if we if we saw everybody was started to use, you know, Swift uh, and TensorFlow Swift, then we'd be sort of thinking in that direction as well. But uh, yeah, I think you know, for our, I think there's still a massive number of users again from that math stats econ background who just want our studio interface. So our studio interface is like the number one requirement. And I think you know that's something the Berkeley team does really well with our, our hub. You know, from a users perception it's not like you're going to that class to teach someone new because you know that's they've been using if they're in maths and stats that's all they've ever used rspss so i think if you put you know a typical um math student or an econ student in front of jupiter they're like oh you know what is this and it's it's that learning curve so i think that again is is really important is having those uis as, as natural as possible to the users Um, uh, I've got to run to my next meeting. Um, it was uh, nice, uh, nice meeting everybody. Uh, please uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter or what have you. Uh, send me an email. It'd be great to be uh, be in touch with folks. I'll put my email address one more time. I don't know why. Whenever I send them a, a message, it seems to be like a sub response to somebody else's message. But that's my uh, email address out there. I've got to run to a meeting. It was nice meeting everybody. Take care. Great. Thanks, Thanks for joining. Nice to chat with you. You too. Um, I'm I'm gonna also. Uh, answer one more question which i've seen which is about uh canvas, Your canvas I yeah i was gonna say yeah 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 so um that's actually a tricky one because um we do this kind of bit of a special thing is that every output in deep node is is iframed and that's because uh when you sometimes run your jupyter notebooks locally you see this um trust this notebook button um popping up and that's because um it's running in your browser and uh, it has access to your cookies and all of these things. So we actually iframe all the outputs and they don't have access to the rest of the, the notebook or the, the basically the, the document object model. So uh, this is a security measurement uh, done by us, which uh, um, uh, unluckily makes some, uh, some things um, not usable, uh, but they are, we can always resolve this on a per module or per package level such as maybe uh, canvas so if we see demand for canvas we'll definitely add a add some support for for that
that's really interesting flip so so one of the things that you know we we demoed in our demo um was you know a lot of the institutions we spoke to didn't want anything i framed within their lms environment so we spawn a new window simply because of that issue is, is because you know security compliance malicious javascript and again you know if you're giving someone something like a jupyter notebook especially if it's got a console within their lms it could be you know potentially quite dangerous depending on on the skills of that individual um but that was just one of the recommendations that we had from all all our consultations was never iframe things within lms's okay got it yeah like um this so far does does the security distinction pretty well uh, i mean we are really open to um doing like um any kind of further iterations on this because it's uh, maybe it's not ideal because it's as i said blocking some other things um cool um so yeah i'm gonna run too um yep. it's getting darker in here it's it's um quite late uh so thanks thank you um lee and yeah drop me an email today. great catch you know yeah yeah sure see ya good to see you thanks everyone